verses of, of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 this morning. I call today the, the purpose of sanctification. And uh, we've, been looking, we've been looking at these, uh, at, at, at First Thessalonians, the first three chapters, I like to think of these as the, the love chapters of, of uh, not only 1 Corinthians 13, we think of first, but 1 first, but first Thessalonians chapters 1 through 3 uh, show love. Love from this perspective of God, love of Paul, Silas, and Timothy unto the Thessalonian believers, and that that love would, would have repercussions to other places as well. So that's the motivation. Remember last week we looked at the, the motivation of love because God is, by definition, love. God doesn't choose to love. God is love. So think of that. Any time you think of God, God is love. You know, and, that, and the answer to those people that say, well, if God is loving and, and, and loves everybody so much, how come we have wars in the world? How come we have a hunger and, and poverty? Why do those things happen? That's not God's fault that did it. That's man and man's own volition, own will, that have turned their backs against the, the, the holy God that created them. We've been looking through the book of Hosea. We see that, you know, uh, prophetically with the nation of Israel, how, how they are the ones that turned away from God and, and gave credit to, to other, other gods, unto Baal. But yet, God still has mercy on his people. Nonetheless, he is going to take his people and finish the, the program, and he's going to rule and reign forever. You know, that's amazing. And for us today, we have these heavenly promises in Christ Jesus. I say it enough, where are we sitting? Right now, we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's positionally, but yet one day, we're predestined for our body to be changed. That's the adoption in, in, in the Bible. That's what happens uh, in, in the Bible. The adoption doesn't come like we think of it in today's language. You know, we think of when you adopt somebody, you adopt a little baby. I have a cousin that went to China, and they, they adopted two babies in China. So that's adoption in the modern sense of, of the word. But back in a Hebrew sense of the world, word adoption came when somebody was ready for the full benefits of their inheritance. Yes, and that's what will happen with us. The adoption takes place. It's the redemption of the body, Romans 8, 23. That's when, when that happens. When we have a new body, when we're changed and glorified like Jesus Christ, that's the adoption. Right now, we, we have these vile bodies, but one day, one day we'll have a glorified body that'll be like the Lord Jesus. I can't imagine we have the pictures kind of through through the prophets and everything and through the book of Revelation about you know, Jesus Christ all, all in glory, dressed in white with, with gold and all these different things. I don't know if we'll look exactly like that, but we're going to be dressed a lot better than we dress today, aren't we? Amen? So, so this has been the, the motivation, the, the, the love, the love from God, the love of God. And then when we move on to chapter 4, uh, we, we will look at the practical application of that love, of salvation in Jesus Christ. But smack at the end of chapter 4 comes another motivation. That is the rapture of the church. Again, that, again, that takes place because of God's love for us, that he's going to take us out of here. You know, I, can't ima I, I, I cannot even imagine what it will be like being with the Lord while, while all, of, all of chaos, while all hell or all heaven breaks out on earth when God brings his judgment. That's what, that's what the motivation in the, in the last two chapters of, of, of 1 Thessalonians are. But today, we are looking at, we are looking at, at some of the things why 
we, have, we should be sanctified in Christ. The purpose of sanctification or, or growing in Christ. Remember, we're, we're justified freely by, freely by His grace, right? We're made right with Him. We're declared righteous by, by God. You know, all of us today, if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, you have been declared righteous by none other than God Himself. If you tried declaring yourself righteous, say, look at me, look at how righteous I am. You're on, you're on shaky ground with God. Just like the napkin that fell to the ground here. Our own righteousness is like that filthy napkin, Isaiah 64, 6. It's as filthy rags, but yet the righteousness of God has been given to us. And so, so we have these examples here in verse number, number 11, we have the example here. Let me open my Bible. That would help, wouldn't it? Now that I have the Bible open, let me open it to the right place. Well, let's read first of all our text. How is that? That would help, probably help things better, right? Let's just read 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, just the last three verses, verses 11 through 13. It says, now, I could stop there, now. <laughs> now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may, may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our, our, of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And Lord, we just pray that, pray that you would add your blessing to your word this morning. Now God him self and our father he's both god and our father i think we've known that since we were kids we've we've all said prayers unto the father god is our father he's the father of the lord jesus christ and our lord jesus christ you know the i i like to think of the the cooperation between the godhead between the father and son and holy spirit Jesus said he doesn't do things on his, uh, by himself, but he does the things that the Father tells him. And the Holy Spirit is a person, unlike some groups would say he's not a force, he's a person that dwells inside of each believer today. In the Old Testament economy, he came down upon people. He, he came upon people, and there was, there was often a temporary empowerment for service in the Old Testament today but we we have the Holy Spirit that dwells within us it's the Holy Spirit that does the baptizing work putting us into Christ and in his body but but the three of them work together let's go over to uh, to Matthew chapter 11 you know th there are so many churches that that have whole series on on relationships can have eight weeks on how to be a better husband, a better wife, a better this, a better that. But I think the example we have is found in the example between God the Father and God the Son. I mean, what an example. Just go to Scripture. We don't need the, the psychological books and handbooks about how you can have a better wife and better life and all those, all those things there. Matthew chapter 11. I said I'm going to get through these verses, but <laughs> Matthew chapter 11, verse number 27. Verse number 27 says, All things are delivered unto me of my Father. Right? The Father communicates all things. There's only one thing the Father didn't communicate that Jesus was left in the dark about was when the kingdom was going to start. 
the apostles uh, on the Mount of Olives before Jesus was taken apart said, when will, when will the kingdom be reestablished? He said, it's not for us to know only the Father in heaven. Only the Father in heaven knows when the rapture of the church is going to happen. He's going to, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes, blam, we're out of that. When is that fullness of the Gentiles? We don't know. Whenever the last person that, that, that calls upon Jesus Christ today, God knows. And God will take his, his, his body out of, this, out of the earth and be in heaven with him. And then all these things will take place. But Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 says, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son. Matt, John chapter 6, we all know that. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father but by me. But the words before that were, how do we know the Father? Philip asked them, we haven't seen the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Both God. The Holy Spirit, God the Father, and God the Son, all part of the Trinity that work together. I, I have to go look back, and in the book of Ezekiel, there's a, a vision by Ezekiel of these wheels, wheel upon wheel, all kind of working together. I get dizzy thinking about it. I like to think about that as the unity of the Godhead, in unity with, with the angels, in unity with Father, Son, and Spirit working together not keeping themselves, not, not keeping each other in the dark. Uh, let me continue here. All things, uh, and, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So to Israel, Jesus spoke of himself. But the people rejected, and Jesus would actually say, if you read me, if you search the scriptures, you know, you, you search the scriptures, thinking in them you'll find life, but if you really search the scriptures in them, you'll find me. Then he would say, whosoever has the Son has what? Life. Right? So Jesus Christ, having him is life. He is the real thing, the original real thing, not Coca-Cola. He's the original real thing that has life, that gives life to those that believe. I just have to... Verse number 28. I always love this verse. I don't care who it's written to. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know, we could take this laden with the cares of the world, laden with our own sufferings, laden. Jesus gives us rest. Man, I'm thankful. Even though my aches and pains are, are worse and worse in this present earthly life, I have rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How can that be? The weight of the law was heavy. But Jesus came and he fulfilled the law. He, he, he fulfilled that law because nobody else could. Not even the Pharisees, not the scribes, not the Sadducees, not the rulers of Israel. But the only problem they had, they thought they were so righteous, they rejected Christ. So we have Matthew chapter, chapter 11 here talking about the unity between Father and Son. And, and when you've seen the Father, you've seen the Son. You've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Have we ever personally seen either one of us in our days? No, we know him not according to the flesh. Has anybody seen God the Father physically? The only thing I know of is Moses getting a glimpse of his backside. That's it, that's all we have. No man has seen his face. But yet, we know Jesus Christ as God, as the Son of God and God the Son. Let's go over to Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter 1.
Verse number one. Now, this is, this is one I, I, I'm going to have to make a hard stop here after, chap, after verse two, because the, much of this chapter lines right up with what was happening in Thessalonica. Again, the, the love for brethren, the love of God, you know, being displayed. Verse number one says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Together. You'll find this theme together throughout throughout the New Testament. You'll find that it's both the Father and Son. We give thank... Oh, wait a minute. I said I was going to stop at verse 2. I will. But that, that's just to make that point. God the Father, God the Son, in complete agreement, in complete communication, what, uh, one for another. Let's go to Titus, chapter number 1. Again, in the greeting, Titus 1... Verse number one, and I'm stopping at verse four. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me, according to the commandment of God, our Savior. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Verse 3 says, God, our Savior. Well, is Jesus God? Amen. It is God, our Savior, as well. We're uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect. Who's God's elect there? The faith of Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. He's the ultimate model of faith for us. He never said no to his dad. Amen? Try that in real application, right? <laughs> he never said no. Right? He, God chose him, right? His, the, pre, the determinate counsel of God was that Jesus would be crucified, buried, and risen again. That's something that's, that hasn't changed. What did he do? He crucified, buried, and he rose again. So the faith of God's elect is Jesus. In the hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot, uh, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. I have, a, I have a question, and this I've seen done at, at county fairs. Is there anything that God cannot do? We just read it. He cannot lie. Why? Because God's God. He's perfect. He's impeccable. Likewise, Jesus Christ cannot lie because he's impeccable as well. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto him, unto God, except for by me. So we look at this, 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 this agreement, this mutuality between God the Father and the Son, and as well as God the Spirit. Let's go back to, to, to uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, the second, for, uh, second half of, the, uh, of this verse 11. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. There's no greater guidance. That's the word direct would be guide. And as far as I know, God did not make it there back to, back to Thessalonica. But does that mean that God is a failure because he didn't guide him? Not at all. 
See, he, later on, he'd say one day he'll see them, their face. He will see the, their face. That's why the rapture is talked about in chapter 4. You know, he'll see their face. He'll know them then. There's no greater guidance given by the Lord. Well, how do we have that guidance today? Like that last week we sang, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. We're not guided by the tablet, we're guided by the Bible. Amen? Let's go to Proverbs chapter 3, a very, a very common place. Proverbs chapter 3. I, I think when you buy Chinese food, rather than putting fortunes, they should put Proverbs. <laughs> Amen? Let's put Proverbs, let's put Proverbs 3, verses, uh, verses 5 and 6. Put that in a fortune cookie. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine understanding, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Amen? How do we learn and grow? How are we guided by the Word of God? We all have a tendency to step away from the Word, right? Out of a matter of convenience. There used to be a day, and this will is, this is, show my age, when everyone carried a Bible to church. They were united in that Bible. It was a conviction. They put, uh, I, had, I think we have out in the front, he's putting the Bible back in Bible church. Because most of the church has forsaken the Bible for every other thing except for the Bible. Right? So we have the Bible to guide us. It used to be a matter of conviction that this is the Word of God. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Well, most of the time we stand on the works of somebody and the works of somebody else in the Bible is just window dressing. You know, it used to be a matter of conviction. Today, the Bible is just a matter of convenience. Amen. Think of that for a second. We don't look to the Bible for first, for, as the first thing in our, I was going to have my gun belt here, but as the first weapon of choice. We look at it after, when it's convenient. Well, I've exhausted every resource. I just sounded like a New Yorker there. Last week I was sounding like a Southerner. Today I just sounded like a New Yorker. We, have, we use the Bible as a last thing. Well, this failed, that failed, this failed. Oh, let me see what the Bible says. Amen? It's something very common that we all do. We all tend to do the same thing. Because what do we get? We get a barrage of, of noise around us. And we listen to that rather than the scriptures. I won't try to sing that song again, the B-I-B-L-E. Let's go over to, uh, over to Jeremiah 10. Jeremiah 10. Oops, pressed the wrong button. Well, speaking of Jeremiah, a little grandson, Jeremiah, Heidi sent out a video, and he, and he, was, he was saying his name. He's, he's saying, Samaya, Samaya. I was like, wow, that, that's pretty good. You know, for a two-year-old, he's, he's getting his name close. But it was so cute. But Jeremiah chapter 10 Not the whole chapter. Verse number 23. And this is dealing with, with judgment of the, the shepherds or pastors of Israel that, that have led the people astray rather than leading them to, 
to God himself. This is a common malady of the nation of Israel. They trusted everything but the Lord and made, uh, they worshiped everything but God himself. You know, God, wasn't, God didn't have quick payouts like the other gods did. You know, and that's something that we have in religion today. People want to feel something. They want to, they want to have something that, that happens. We, we're in a, in a society where we want instant gratification. We want it now. We want to turn the corner after, after one-tenth of a second when the light changes. How dare that guy in front take three seconds. <laughs> right? Amen? Verse number 23 says, O oh Lord... I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Pour out thou fury, the, thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob and devoured him and consumed him, and have made his habitation desolate. But the way, here's the, what I want to get to, verse 23, the, the way of man is not in himself. How often do we hear, you know, here's how to find out if something's right. Did you feel it in your heart? Right? We hear that. It's not in our, himself. The way, of, the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Well, if it's not up to man to direct his steps, who's it up to? This would be from Jeremiah's standpoint. It'd be up to God. Paul asked the Lord to, to direct their way unto them. Did, we, did he make it? No. But still, it was the Lord that directed his steps, and knowing that he'd one day see him again. Let's go to, back to Thessalonians, but let's go to 2 Thessalonians. Here's a preview. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm going to go through verses 1 through 5. Verse 1 kind of answers the end of, of verse 11 of, of 1 Thessalonians 3. It says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified as it is with you. So even if Paul didn't see their face again, he had the report earlier of Timothy that they were doing well. But he still longed to see them. He prayed that the Lord would guide them, but, but he'd know in the back of his mind what was going on. The, the word of the Lord would have the free course. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. Yet they don't have the faith of the Lord. They remain unreasonable. The Roman soldiers, for the most part, would, would have their faith in something else. They'd have their faith in their gods and would continue to persecute. Verse number 3 says, But, as that great eraser once again Erasing verse number, uh, verse number two, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. Amen. You want to keep from evil? Be established. Be established, established in the Word of God. There's a whole controversy out there between the old English says establish and it's been changed from established in other Bibles. It's the same word, just a modern, you know, modern word is establish. But establish means to be, be put in place, to remain in place. When you lay down a foundation, like you look at new foundations that go down deep, that's not going to move. That's how we should be established as well, into a place where we're not moved, you know, by, by the circumstances around us but be established in the Lord. The Lord, but the Lord is faithful who shall, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you or as to you. 
that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and unto the patient waiting for Christ. Let's start the stopwatch. The Lord could come at any time, right? The rapture of the church could happen just like that in a second. Uh oh, it's been 13.5 seconds. Where is he? That's right, he says patient waiting. Because if the Lord doesn't, if, it, if the rapture doesn't happen right now, it's going to happen in the next minute. And if it's not the next minute, it's going to be the next minute. What have we? We, we? Then we'll have no longer any earthly time, right? It'll be eternal. Man, we think we have long lives nowadays, but yet eternal life. People will question that. Eternal doesn't really mean eternal. I'm like, what? He takes some, some other, other uh, meaning of it and changes the epoch, which, is a, which can be a set time. But eternal is eternal. What part of eternal life do we not get? By, by faith in what Jesus Christ did, you have eternal life. No other reason. No, nothing at all. Eternal life means eternal. It's been given as a gift of God. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. So we've seen the, the, how, the, the, how the Father and Son work together. We see that the, they will guide through the Word of God. And we also will see in verse 12 that sanctification grows in us true riches. Amen. I remember there was a song several years ago that says, If I had a million dollars... Adjusted for inflation, they would have to change that to a billion dollars nowadays. But we have riches untold. Our sanctification, our growing in Christ Jesus will, will cause uh, true riches to grow. Amen? Earthly riches come and go. Here today, gone tomorrow. I still have that $5 billion Zimbabwe note that used to be on par with the U.S. dollar, which doesn't say much anymore. But at the time when you got a, a Zimbabwe dollar bill, it was worth one U.S. dollar. That $5 billion note I got before the, the country totally collapsed uh, would be worth about, about 10 cents on the dollar. But you would have to keep on paying higher prices. Do you want to know why you're paying higher prices you know, at, in the grocery store? It's that. It's that. They're, they're making more money out of thin air and raising the prices. All right, the economics lesson's over. <laughs> uh, verse number 12 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And the Lord make you to increase and abound. I'm going to stop right there because I'm going to say, see, the Lord wants you to be rich. Well, he does, but not financially, not, not with health. If that were true, we'd all be, we'd all be walking examples. Nobody would have, have glasses or, or I saw a picture of myself on my ID that expired in 2020. I had brown hair. There was no grays just a few years ago. Unbelievable. We'd all, be, we'd all have perfect health and wealth, all those things. But our riches are truly in Christ Jesus and the eternity that we have. The earthly riches come and go, yet the attributes of God never goes away. He's eternal. He is God. He is, as we already said, He is love. God's fruit never rots. Think of that for a second. What is God's fruit? Love, joy, faithfulness, peace, all those things in, in Galatians chapter 5. Those things never rot, right? God doesn't make rotten fruit. 
The secret sauce, you remember when the Big Mac first came out? You guys won't remember when it first came out. That was back in the dinosaur days, they tell me. They made a lot about their secret sauce. Remember that? They had the Big Mac. Two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. That special sauce was the key. I think it's been revealed what that special sauce is today. I think you could buy, get a hack on YouTube that shows you how to recreate the special sauce and you order a Big Mac without the special sauce and you make your own special sauce. You get a Big Mac for half the price. Something like that. But what is the special sauce? With God, with, with sanctification, that special sauce or the secret sauce is love. The love of God that binds people together in Him. It, it, uh, it abounds following up in the same verse. He says, and the, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love. One toward another. Remember first, abound in love, growing in love, overflowing with love, one toward another. And the second part is the tough part. One toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. The example that they had of their love that they showed to the Thessalonians. It's the same example that God has for us today. And uh, I just, I'm not going to go through all these. There's two pages of references just to love one another. You know, right through all of the, all of the New Testament. Uh, I'll just read a couple. John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. I think I can fly through these. You can, on YouTube, you can slow it down to half speed. So, <laughs> You can also speed it up to twice the speed so to get it over quickly. Uh, the next verse says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. And I think back in chapter 12, you had the sons of thunders, Lord, grant us that we sit at your right side, right hand. It's like it's not for me to know. That was one of the things he didn't know, because in the kingdom, there'll be 12, 12 thrones by the 12 disciples. They'll, have their, their, they'll rule in the millennial kingdom. So that will be decided then. Uh, John, John 15, 12 says, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Pretty easy, but tough at the same time. Verse uh, John 15, 17, These things I command you that you love one another. Romans 13, 8, O man, uh, O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Remember, what's the, what's the, what's the, uh, the whole royal law? Love, love one another, right? That's God's whole purpose in salvation. It's based on love. Uh, Galatians 5.13, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Remember, I like to quote, quote Martin Luther King, Free at last, free at last. Praise God Almighty, we're free at last. Free from the bondage or yoke of sin. Free from the bondage or yoke of the law. We've been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Don't use it for, don't use that liberty to, to get your own way. I can do anything I want. Try it. Amen. Ephesians, or, or, or yeah, Ephesians 4, verse 2, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. I love, remember we went through forbearing, being like a roof with supports and and when it's forbearing, it's, the pressure is upon that roof. So put up, deal with that pressure that comes upon, upon you and love one another one, forbearing one another and love. 1 Thessalonians 3.12, we're, we're there. 1 Thessalonians 4.9, But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And later he says, I don't even have to repeat this over again, even though he did. That you're told. Hebrews 10, 24. 
And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. 1 Peter 1, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. That's a tough one. I, I'm not too fervent a lot of times nowadays. So. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, Finally, let all let be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. 1 John 3, 11, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. 1 John 3, 23, And this is commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. 1 John 4, 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. The next verse says, No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Then lastly, 2 John 1, 5, And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. It's a real stress on loving one another, isn't there? That's an attribute of God's love that's given to us. And then lastly, the closing, back in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 13, says, to the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. The outcome of our sanctification is that our hearts be established. Rooted, Colossians 2, 7, that we, that we be rooted and built up in the faith, that we be grounded in Christ. Establish your hearts unblameable uh, in holiness. How long do we, are we unblameable in holiness? Till the coming of the Lord. And again, here in 1 Thessalonians, I th believe this, is, this coming of the Lord is talking about the rapture of the church. There's other places the context would, ta would talk about the second coming, the day of the Lord, which is the seven-year period of tribulation. But here, till the coming of the Lord, let's, let's look at it a little bit. The end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. In other words, we can stand before God holy, our garments white, our garments unspotted by sin. That's what Jesus Christ has done. And that can only be a gift that's given by God Himself through Christ Jesus. That we stand in holiness before God, even our Father. I like that. I stress the even. Have Jesus Christ and God the Father, the loving Father, the one who in the spirit of adoption, we cry out, Abba, Father. A term of endearment for the Father. Amen. We have that spirit of adoption, but one day we will have that adoption when we are with him, when, when the Lord takes us out of here. In holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Now, if we go back to the, New, the Old Testament, you'll find all those saints are, are angels or holy ones. They come with the Lord. You also have the, 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 uh, the, the people that go through the tribulation, they come into the, the millennial kingdom. But I think what here, with, with his saints, I think he's inclusive of all the other believers that trusted him. You're not separated and segregated from everybody else. You know, sometimes we can do that. We say, well, we have it, everything right. All our T's are crossed and I's are dotted and everything. We're a special class, but with all his saints. Everybody who has trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for their salvation is counted in there. 
be taken out at the same time. There are some people that teach a partial rapture, that you need to be walking perfectly in obedience to God, or God's going to leave you here. To what? What's the word I'm looking for? It's a complicated word. Balderdash. How's that? That sounds good. Balderdash. If salvation is a gift, Romans chapter 4, it's a gift of God. There's no more law, right? We don't follow the law because it's no more grace if it's of the law. And if it's of the law, there's no more grace. So it's saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I think this means out of here. No say, I said think. I can't be dogmatic about it. But I think this just includes all believers who, who are saved. All believers who are believers. How's that? I think that's fairly clear. So we have this hope in Christ. Again, first, uh, back in, in 1 Thessalonians 2.9 has the same language of the 2.19. Uh, let's go, let me go back there for a second. 1 Thessalonians 2.19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? This is where the answer is in verse 11. God will direct his way unto them. He'll see them again at the coming, at the, at the rapture of the church. God, Paul will see those believers once again. Imagine that. Someday seeing those people that you ministered to. Imagine Paul seeing, seeing those people that believed the gospel when he preached. Seeing them face to face. He might have, there might have been a conversion in, in, in Antioch and he was, he was put to death in Rome. Never saw their face, but one day they'll see this face. You know, that's, that's assuring. I didn't say reassuring, but assuring. Outcome is that we be established in our hearts. That we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that number one, was saved. And number two, because of that salvation, you be established in the grace of God and the love of God, which will be our motivation for our earthly walk today. That's what sanctification is all about. Growing in him. That'll be my next search. How many times does it say in him or in Christ? Isn't it great? We're in Christ. That's why we have such protection from everything around. God sees Jesus before he sees us. He sees his righteousness before he sees us. Amen? Because we've been... We've been redeemed by Jesus himself. Amen? All right. No other way to close that up except for the, that fact. Our hope is in the Lord. Our hope is in the guidance of the Lord. Amen? In Christ Jesus. Well, we're gonna...